If you are to do well on the digital information external, you really have to think about your internal program and how are you integrating that external content all throughout the year in part, as part of your internal assessment um, program. Welcome to our CDTT session and we just say thank you to Judy from coming up, for coming up from Dunedin to run the session for us. Julie's been involved in writing some of the achievement standards so she has an insight as to what is expected. Plus I notice in the latest North and South that Julie's got a little piece there from TechLink which is pretty good. Um, so thank you very much for coming Julie, it's really great. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, the format of the day is we basically four sessions don't panic, Julie's the only one who's being um, videoed, um, so that what she has to say can also go to other regions, because other regions um, are perhaps not as uh, wealthy as we are, or as in terms of actually resources and people, and they do struggle. So it's just to help them as well, particularly as John is president of NZDIT, Dit, and we've got Gerard who's on the committee as well. So um, that's basically it. So I'll say thank you, Judy. Over to you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you also for coming on a Saturday. Um, as Vilna said, I'm Julie McMahon, and I'm head of technology and digital technology at Columba College in Dunedin. Uh, as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm not originally from New Zealand, but I've been here for nine years. I'm an American, and my husband's a New Zealander, so I um, bring sort of different experience in teaching um, IT-related subjects for about 26 years now, and I've also worked in industry and have a systems engineer certification, so I've done lots of different things, but mainly teaching, and I always come back to teaching, because that's my passion in life. Um, this workshop, I'm just modeling it on a workshop that we ran at the very beginning of the term down in Otago. I'm involved with the NZAC DIT cluster in Otago, and I guess I'm the leader down there because by de facto. <laughs> um, I was involved in the original BTG groups with Vilna and Joyce, and because I think the um, when the DTG funding went away and Zach Ditt sort of took the place of the DTG clusters and because I had been involved in that, I've just kept on and worked with NZAC Ditt and we have a really good cluster going down there um, as well now. I know Christchurch has always had sort of a good professional development group. We didn't have that before the DTG down in Otago, I didn't feel, and now we've, um, we have a good professional development group and meet regularly. Um, so anyway, this is just uh, basically I'm presenting the material that our, uh, our committee presented at the beginning of this year to the Targo group. And part of it came about because um, Mary Gill, who's also on the national committee for NZAC, that she teaches the Otago girls, and Justin Scott, who's on my committee down there, they're both the Otago girls, um, Rob Wood from Bayfield and Luke Smith and myself from Colombo. We thought we felt good after we saw our results from our externals and we thought how can we help our region. So we got this um, workshop together just to show things that we had been doing, that we did in our level one programs and where we thought um, we had successes in our externals. So I've termed this Review 2011, Improve for 2012. As you know, in 2011, this is the first year for all of us with these new achievement standards. And I think we all were sort of scrambling, getting together new assessment resources, putting together brand new programs of learning. And I think it's time for all of us to step back and say, what went really well last year? What do I want to keep out of that? What went not so well? What can I ditch out of that? And then how can how can we improve our programs for 2012? So that's also probably the focus of this is thinking what what went well and what went not so well. What can we improve upon? And I'm 
would like to share with you some of the things that I thought went well as part of our program. Um, one more thing. I'll just here. So for in the morning, I'd like to present some strategies for integrating the external. I mean, the, the main focus of this is obviously that in, digital information external. But if you are to do well on the digital information external, you really have to think about your internal program and how are you integrating that external content all throughout the year in part, as part of your internal assessment um, program. So I'll be looking at that. Um, I will go through a sample level one year plan. It's our year plan. It was. It's also up on TechLink um, right now. I don't know if you've seen the link come through. There are some sample year plans on, on TechLink. So this is one that um, I developed last year with uh, my colleague Luke Smith at school. And I had actually been working on it from 2010 and presented it originally at that digital, um, that last DTG symposium. So it's something that I've been developing for uh, quite a bit of time now. Um, I have some example external notes documents, one that um, I use at Columba and one that a person um, emailed me, Margaret McClay from Newland School. She just emailed me, saw some comments that I had made on the NZAC list and said, oh, here's what we did. If you want to use this in any of your workshops or anything, here you go. So um, I'll show you what she's done. Um, I have some examples of our internal assessments, but also how the external content, I link that all throughout our internal assessment program. And then an example external assessment test, the one that I wrote and gave to our students. So I'll share that with you. You can have them all. They're all on the P drive. I think John's put all, this, yeah, all the material that I'm presenting here. It's all um, on the P drive. And anything that you want to use, feel free to use it or modify it. Don't mind. And then, so after all of that, in the afternoon, we'll really look at the, the um, standard itself and break down that AME criteria and look at snippets of student responses in the AME categories for each part. So, and review the, some of the exemplars in the examiner's report. All right, this is from the examiner's report. And by the way, I don't know, probably all of you, because um, it's been on the list, uh, it just came out this week, finally, I think, was it this week or yeah, over yeah. the Easter holidays, anyway. The examiner's report and all of the exemplars, I've downloaded them and they're also here, just in case you haven't had a chance to download all that material, they're on um, in that folder. But we have to think that the, the standard says demonstrate understanding. That's the main focus, demonstrate understanding of concepts of um, information management. So candidates who clearly demonstrated understanding of basic concepts of information management wrote in their own voice, providing evidence from their own work and experience to support any factual or reference material. Candidates who applied sourced material in a specific context made good use of the sources. Where knowledge identified from a source was applied in the specific context, it was obvious that the candidate had demonstrated understanding. And candidates whose reports relied heavily on NZQA exemplars, internet sites, commercially available resources, or supplied notes did not clearly demonstrate their own understanding. Now, sorry for reading all that to you, but I thought just in case you haven't looked at that part of the examiner's report, I think this is the heart of what we're trying to get at. For students to demonstrate understanding of the concepts and to genuinely demonstrate understanding, they need to make reference to some of their own material, of their own work throughout the year. If they are to use internet sites or books or workbooks, they need to say, all right, this is what Wikipedia says, this is what I did, therefore, um, this is my understanding of that concept. Um, it's, 
it's not enough for students to demonstrate understanding to just take a chunk of information off the internet and say, you know, even according to Wikipedia, an operating system is. And even if they properly reference that, just by putting that in doesn't really mean they demonstrate understanding of an operating system. But if they say, according to Wikipedia, you know, this is a definition of an operating system, and here's a key feature of an operating system, this is how I use it. So I have several browsers um, open, and I also have a Word document open, and the operating system allows me to multitask so that I can switch back and forth between my applications. So if they're showing how they have applied that knowledge, that's demonstrating the understanding. Um, so therefore, I feel like it's very important to integrate the external content all year long. So it doesn't become a report at the end of the year where students feel compelled to go out grab some factual bits of information, slap it into a report, and then turn it in. If they are all throughout the year just gaining snippets of knowledge and saying, aha, that's how I have applied that particular snippet of knowledge, which I'll show you in a minute, um, they're sort of building their understanding all throughout the year. And then when it comes to submit the report, they, they, they will have it. They'll have it all um, put together. Um, to demonstrate understanding the basic concepts, students need to be able to give examples of how they have applied, considered, utilized the concepts in their own work. Now I'm going... Um, before I go here, I'm just going to say one other piece of background information which I discussed with Roman, which is probably important for you to realize. If you, many of you, like myself, we first were using, or you may have used up until this point, computing unit standards or been assessing with information management achievement standards or a combination of both in your classes. And I also have done that at Columba. I came from that background as well. We were doing National Certificate in Computing Levels 2 and 3. We had the Information Management Achievement Standards at Level 1. About five years ago now, I think, I switched to using the Technology Achievement Standards in, as part of my digital technologies or computing classes at the time. Now, Within the technology achievement standards, the external assessments have always been a portfolio-based assessment, or at level three it's a written report, much like we have at level one, and it's a reflection on the year's work. So I have to say that I came to this level one um, external with that paradigm in my head because I had been doing that for about five years where we were submitting a portfolio at the end of the year for levels one and two and a report at the end of the year for level three where the students had been building on information all throughout the year and then at the end of the year sort of consolidated that knowledge and turned it in. The other thing I do want to comment on, I know when we did this workshop in Dunedin, and one of the teachers said, um, well, how, could, how did so many of us get it so wrong, or how come I didn't understand that? And I said, don't beat yourself up about it. I know the very first year that we tried to submit technology portfolios, we didn't do so well <laughs> in our externals. And I looked at it and I said, what's wrong? And I got the technology advisor in and I discussed things with her. And she said, just because the kids have put snippets of um, copied and pasted some, some information that they've gotten off the internet into their portfolios does not mean they've demonstrated understanding. I clearly remember her saying that to me. Um, she said, the markers consider it um, sort of just 
additional bump or things that just build up their portfolio, but they have not reflected on it and it doesn't really show that they've demonstrated the, the understanding. And she got me to start this process of kids annotating their work and saying, I've learned this from the internet or, um, you know, I've applied this because, and we started doing a lot of screenshotting, annotating, visual diary work, and I think that's where I was coming from in our year plan for level one in my head. So again, I'm just saying that if you're thinking, I didn't, I didn't get that from reading that um, external assessment when I read the standard, I didn't get that that's how it should work. Um, probably um, it wasn't that clear that that's maybe how it should work. So don't beat yourself up as a teacher about that. Um, I just think that for, for going forward, if you can think, if I'm embedding it all throughout the year and if the students are building up the knowledge and if they're able to reflect on it in their own words, they will fly. I can guarantee they will fly at the end of the year. And one other thing I'll say is, um, I had a student last year, I have her again this year, very, very dyslexic. She's probably one of our lower ability students. She's going to probably take two years. We've just had a meeting to do level two, and we just would like her to get through level two. She was able to submit this, and um, she actually got an excellence, which I about cried when I saw her grade, <laughs> because it, um, it was a struggle for her to write it, but it was, again, it was just building up that knowledge all throughout the year. So don't say, oh, I've got really low literacy kids. They cannot write this report. They can. They can do it if it's sort of slowly built up throughout the year. Okay. So um, in our year plan, for each unit of work throughout the year, I, we specifically integrate some of the topics for the external assessment. Mm. I'll just bring this up. You don't have to read all of the guff in the front. Get down to the good part. All right. Um, so what I did, what I, what we hope to do in each module, we do a little bit of generic technology. We do some digital technology internal and some digital technology external, sort of combined throughout our each sort of unit of work. And for those of you, you may have already seen this on TechLink or on NZECDIT, but we run a theme throughout the year. So our for our level one program, we have a computer game theme. And I teach in an all-girls school, and you think, oh, computer gaming, that's a boys thing. But the girls actually love it. They're really, really, really into it. So um, just by way of background information, what we do is during term one, the girls for their digital information internal, they actually prepare a survey. And this year we have them make a Google Docs survey. So they survey um, people about their game preferences. They survey other students in year 11 about what their computer game preferences are. They take that information from their Google Docs survey that they make. They download that into Excel they bring it into um, access into a database, and then they run different queries to find out what are the most popular things in computer games. And then from there, they actually make another query that's their stakeholder, their final stakeholder query. So they narrow down people with similar game preferences, and I say they have to narrow it down to about three to five people who are going to be their stakeholders in their computer game development. And then they have to create a mail merge document based on their database that they come up with three ideas for their computer game based on their stakeholders' main preferences. If it's they like lives or levels or fantasy or being able to change characters or whatever that is. And then they send out that mail merge document to their stakeholders and then narrow down their game idea. So um, that's 
that's part of our computer game theme. We're getting some of generic technology, talking about stakeholders and preferences and looking at things like that. And we're getting in our digital information in there, so they're combining um, Word and a database, and they're actually bringing in some Excel. So we do that during term one. We've just finished that. And then during term two, they're actually, they learn how to use Game Maker. And then they program up their computer game based on their stakeholder preferences. And those people are their testers and give them feedback and all of that. Um, we run the generic prototype development standard as an umbrella over the top of that. So they have to trial their resources, trial their techniques, like if it's if they're going to pick up types of moves or move free or move fixed and different types of um, sprites and things like that. So that's all of this term. They'll be developing their computer game prototype. And then during term three, they we do digital media and they actually develop their um, DVD box art for um, burning their game, they burn their game onto a DVD and then do their DVD cover and their box art. So we put in Adobe Illustrator and they learn how to draw in Adobe Illustrator so that they have to create all of their own logo for their computer game, all of their own illustrations and then they bring that into InDesign and they design the box art and um, come up with that. So we run this theme throughout the year. So when you see this and you think, oh, generic, specific prototype development, what's going on? By the end of the year, they have surveyed their stakeholders, found out their preferences, created a computer game, done their testing with their stakeholders, and then developed their final marketing material to present their game. And they, so then they have some computer programming, um, they have the digital media, and they have the digital information, and then they've got one of the generic standards over the top. So that's how our, how our year works. Now for each one of those, we think, how can we integrate the external content? So if you look here, um, we do do a specific focus at the beginning of the year, just talking about their operating system and their key features of their operating system. So we look at, our, our students have <coughs> Mac, um, sorry, they all have Mac laptops. It's thinking, hopefully. Wake up, wake up. All right, our students, we're lucky because they have Mac laptops and then we have Windows desktops in the computer lab. And so we just look at what do you, what are the operating system features on your Mac that you access compared to Windows, compared to your smartphone, if you have your smartphone. So we just start analyzing operating system key features. Then for our specific application software, we look at word processing and database. So I'll show you in, a, in just a minute when we're actually learning our word processing skills like styles, etc., cetera, um, and our database queries, um, you know, forms or reports or whatever we're doing, we have them identify those key features, how and why they've used them. And so we have them start building those things um, throughout the year. We discuss ethical issues related to information management, so things about privacy and security, things with their operating systems. Starting on the purpose and conventions of file management procedures and use of storage devices. Um, so again, having them, just those things that you would do at the beginning of the year anyway. Setting up your files and folders. Why is, why should you have good file management? All of that, and then we might have them do a few screenshots of evidence of that and, and start taking some notes about that. Um, what are threats to data that we might have to um, just talk about or worry about? And also, especially with databases, so we can, since we're talking about databases, why is it really important that we back up work in a database, or what would happen if somebody hacked into the school's database, et cetera? So we just link those things together. And then we start that comparing and contrasting file types for different purposes. And since we're 
discussing word processing and um, databases at the beginning of the year, we start looking at those file types. So a PDF versus a doc versus a um, you know, docx versus an ODT document. So we look at all sorts of word processing file types and then look at the um, database file types, etc. So that we integrate during term one. And then the other side is just our digital information. Um, during, and that this just shows the um, our our assessment thing. So it, it's that survey asking them questions about their game preferences. They have to have a database to store the information, a mail merge document that presents their top three game ideas, and then they have to document their process. <laughs> document their process, which they don't always love, but then they realize they've got all that information. So when we get into our module two, which is around term two, we don't say, um, all right, we've already covered all the information for the external, we're done with that. We revisit it again and we will go back and we'll open up our notes document and discuss some more things. So when it comes to operating systems, we'll talk about different operating systems for game platforms. So what does that mean and why is that important? So if you're a game developer, you have to know what platform you're aiming for or do you want it across platforms or is it going to work on an on an Android phone, you know, is it, is it developed for that or is it going to be developed strictly for um, Windows or strictly for Mac operating system? And what's nice about that, we can bring things in, like we use GameMaker. I don't know if anyone's using that or has used that. It's a free download. Um, it, you can download a Mac version and you can download a Windows version. The Windows version is a little bit better than the Mac version because they have, they keep the Mac version one release behind, and they also don't let you um, port that out to an app file, but the Windows version makes an executable file, so they start looking at differences in, you know, in, the, in the platforms. We discuss application software as far as programming IDEs. Most of them have tried Scratch and Alice in the past, so we, then now we're introducing Game Maker, and so we can do some compare and contrast. What are the differences and similarities? What are some key features of programming IDEs, and why might you want to use one over the other? Which also relate, you know, brings that um, into the external, and then with the ethical issues, we look at ethical issues related to game development. So. Um, we talk about use of sprites. Um, we don't allow them to use anything that's a ripped sprite. And we say there's so many sprite rips out there on the internet where people have just stolen sprites from other people's games and they're not allowed to do that. They have to get something from a Creative Commons site or they have to make it themselves. So we can discuss things like that. Use of sounds, royalty free sounds like free, um, freeplaymusic.com. Um, and then we also talk about um, violence and appropriate content in games. So then we can bring those ethical issues again that are part of the external, but we can relate it to what we're doing in our internal program. Um, all of them as part of their internal assessment. We say the game has to be suitable for year 11 students at the school. <laughs> so they, you will see when you see some of our write-ups, they all say, well, we couldn't have it it you know, can't have any violence because it has to be played at the school and we surveyed our, st and some of them do, they write um, in their stakeholder surveys, they know that, so they say, would you be offended by mild game violence and <laughs> all of that, so they bring that in. Oh, the other thing they bring in on ethical issues, I forgot to mention, when we have them make their survey, we have them opt in, so they, we talk about that. If um, people don't want their information published, or is it okay to use my data? So they write one of those yes or no questions on their survey, and they discuss that. So again, that's just reinforcing the ethical 
use of information. Um, we discuss that with the file management part of the external. We bring in conventions related um, to gay resources, so like using underscores and using consistent naming throughout your gay resources, and you'll see later that some of my students have discussed that in their external. So, um, you know, I named all of my sprites with SPR in the front in a, in a reasonable name, so I knew which one I was grabbing. All my sounds start with sound. So we bring in those sorts of naming conventions as well. Um, it's really good for, you know, that whole thing with zipping and unzipping and compression. And if you want to have, like for example, if they want to download Game Maker, which is free from Yo-Yo Games, it it's comes in a zip file, so perfect, okay? We're going to talk about zipping and unzipping and um, uploading and downloading things from the internet. Or I, um, we put on the, um, on our student shared drive, a folder full of resources which are zipped, which are freely available sources that we've sourced for them for their sprites and their sounds so that they don't waste too much time on the internet um, searching for things. We say you can use these, we know that they're, that they're um, royalty free. And then again, we talk about unzipping, downloading those from our student shared drive and unzipping those. So that's a really good time to discuss those things. Um, and then comparing that, comparing and contrasting the use of different file types for different purposes. When they make their game maker file, the native format is a GMK, so that's that editable file format. It also makes um, GB1s, which is the backup file. And when they want to um, distribute it, it, they can make an executable file. So then we bring in that difference. Just and we compare it back to Microsoft Word. So when you're working in Microsoft Word and you want to keep editing it, then you keep it as a Word doc. And when you want to publish that and you don't want anybody to change it, you make it a PDF file, so you convert it to a different file type. When you're working on your game, the whole time you're editing it, you are keeping that in its native file format, GMK, when you want to distribute it so that other people can play it without having to have the um, source code, you know, without the compiler there, then you make it an EXE file and then that protects the game from editing and it also lets you distribute it. So we bring that in here as well. And, um, just while I'm on that, I know a lot of our students also talked about the PDF and the EXE as far as ethical issues and copyright because they said, they've said, once I make it a PDF file for turning in, people can't alter my work and so it's saved. Or once I make it an executable <coughs> file, I can distribute it but nobody can edit, um, you know, edit my source code and take my game. So they, they link that in as well. Um, and so that's just what we do as far as looking at some skill development and looking at the game development process. There's a really good, if you are doing any computer game even as part of your programming at level one, there's a couple good case studies on TechLink. There's um, She Interactive and there's also one they've just put up there. Oh, Little Big Bang? Little, big Little Bang? <laughs> it's a New Zealand company that's developed this online gaming world, and it's a really, really good um, um, case study that shows how they go about developing computer games and their prototyping process and putting it out in beta and testing it. And it's also talking about ethical issues because um, it's an online gaming environment for little... You know, young young students. I think it's aimed at sort of ages maybe eight to twelve, and so there's a lot in there about ethical issues with um, having an online virtual environment and keeping it safe for young younger age groups. So that's a really good one. If you just go onto their case studies.
Um, but that new one is great. That's the one we used last year. We're just starting it this year, and I'm going to have the kids also look at Big, I think it's Big Little Bank. <laughs> And then in our final um, module for the year, where we're doing our digital media, again, we take the opportunity to bring in some more of the external content. So um, we talk about operating systems again, and um, like they'll be maybe installing fonts, cross-platform applications, because we've got um, the Adobe suite on their Mac computers, it's also available on the Windows computers, and so we bring up things like that. Um, with application software, we look at all the different graphics applications that they've learned and have available to them. And for the most part, um, we are really, really focusing in year 11 on vector graphics, so vector versus raster now, because they've done a lot in their in years 9 and 10, maybe with Photoshop or Paint or um, GIMP or whatever, and they've done a lot of just raster graphics, and now we start talking about vector graphics. So if you want things that are scalable, if you want to draw things yourself, um, so we bring in that. And then we also look at desktop, public, desktop publishing applications. They've got, um, we have publisher on the, on the um, Windows desktops, they have pages on their Mac laptops, and then we really focus on InDesign and look at sort of the differences um, between those. And the key features, <laughs> so we'll look at the key features of what they're using. And again, discussing those ethical issues, so now the ethical issues are related to dig digital image creation, and this is... Um, you know, if you're doing your digital media unit, this is really a great time to hone in on those ethical issues because when you're creating digital imagery or if you're creating a website or sound or whatever, that original content is so important and it's part of the digital media internal, isn't it, that they have to be creating their own original content. So it works in really well here. Um, so again, about copyright and privacy and creative comments, comment, uh, comments, sorry, inappropriate content. Um, and the whole, our whole stress is that they're creating their own logo for their own game and they, they are then, you know, what, how would they feel if somebody then took that logo and published their game and published their logo? So we're trying to get them to create their own original work and think about that. Um, the file conventions and folder management for digital images, so um, for desktop publishing. So if you're going to have your images, then maybe you want your original, you want your flattened files, how are you going to name those, um, making sure that you don't have your images sitting there somewhere on your desktop and then your desktop publishing document somewhere else and then you know in InDesign when the links all break because you <laughs> haven't actually put those things together and suddenly you know they found out that oh why is that image all fuzzy well, because the because I just have the link sitting there and I haven't actually I don't have the file in the right folder so it's a really good um, experience a learning experience for that file and um, folder naming conventions. Um, comparing and contrasting the file types, again we look at raster and vector graphics. So when, when would you use a raster versus a vector type graphic and we look at the different file types. Um, native Adobe Illustrator, the AI file, when would you want to JPEG or a PSD or a TIFF or an InDesign file and a PDF file. So that's another good opportunity to bring up all of those comparing and contrasting file types. And the rest of this is our skill development and our assessment. So, um, And I have links to all of the assessment tests within here. So, um, I'll just stop. I have a little. I'll, I'll explain this in more detail in a minute. But how much time are they spending outside for classroom time? Teaching time, covering meals. Um, it's a 
good question. Probably not as much as I'd like. <laughs> they do, when it comes down to an assessment time, they're probably spending a couple of, I would just say a couple of hours a week on it. They do come in a lot of, in computer labs at lunch time, work on the weekends. It's, I find that probably like most of you, that they don't do much between time until it's the assessment. <laughs> and then suddenly, oh yes, we better sit down and really, really, really focus. Um, what's been really nice this year, uh, well last year and this year, we did become a laptop school last year, so all of the students have their own laptop, it's a requirement. Whereas before, I never felt like I could say, you, you go home and you work on this, you, you do some of this research or do whatever and come back. Um, now you, you can say that because we know all the so they all have the same software and we can send them home with a little bit more homework, which is really nice um, compared to the past because I don't feel like, in the past I felt like I might be disadvantaging some students who wouldn't have access to it. But now we do have a little bit more, um, more leeway with that. Judy, do you have them as a, um you talked about a visual diary. Mm. Is it a, a book or is it electronic? Which, which one do they prefer? Well, that's a good question as well. Last year, we, and in the past, I've always had them have a, a visual diary, like a, a, a book visual diary to sketch in. And um, we had our years 10 and 11 have A4 Visual Diaries books and years 12 and 13 have the big A3 ones. What we've found is that uh, um, most of them, A, because they have their laptops now, they just prefer to type most of their work up. And what they were doing is then typing it, printing it, and gluing it in their visual diary. <laughs> uh, that wasn't really the point, you know, that's just sort of redundant. So this year we actually changed our stationary requirements and um, also based on the fact that I had one really hyper-organized student last year who did it perfectly, I thought. She had one clear file for each assessment and so she just printed off and pulled out any pages and put them in per assessment and gave me one clear file for each uh -huh. one. And it was so easy to mark where the other girls had all their stuff piled in this one big huge book. visual diary and I was always clicking through it and seeing what related to what. So they have four our stationary requirements. I had them have three 20 page clear files for each one of these sort of main assessment tasks where they can put in all of their printouts. Um, they have one bigger clear file for any handouts that I'm just giving them, you know, their year planner and mm -hmm. handouts, etc. And then we had them actually get a quad book, like a maths quad book with grids, mm -hmm. because that's the best for sketching. So if they want to sketch a layout for something, we do still have them do some written and hand sketching, but we have them do it in just a, a maths quad book with grids. Yeah. And, um, and then they can tear pages out of that, or like I've just had my year 11s turn in um, an assessment task, and they've just put their quad book in the front of their clear file so I can see any sketching work that they've done for their layouts of their survey and their knowledge document. Okay, so yeah. it's mostly electronic. So now it's mostly electronic, yep. Um, I give them the option though, I always give them the option, because some, I have a couple of girls that are really creative and they just love to doodle and draw. So if they love, love, love to doodle and draw, I don't care if it's all handwritten, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, most of them, and again, I am in a girls' school, I know that. <laughs> girls are notoriously, oh, many of them are notoriously neat. I have two teenage boys who don't give a care about presentation. But girls like it neat, and that's the other thing we found. They like it typed up, they like it neat, they like borders, they like color. And so um, having it electronically, and then they can print their final copy and just stick it in the clear file, they sort of like that better. I found some of them were rewriting or retyping things they had written by hand, but I didn't really care if they did, but they wanted it to look neater. <laughs> so that's where we've, we're trying that for the first time this year, is that they're having three clear files, one per assessment, and a, and a quad book for sketching, and they keep all of their information basically on their computers. And now that they have their own laptops, they just 
too, but you do yeah. it. That's all there is. And it's backup. Isn't and it? it's so backup, yep. yeah. Is that a school wide problem? They do, most of them, most of them, although we don't make year 11 a, we don't make year 10 a absolute prerequisite. I would say probably 80% come in with having done year 10 digital tech and all of them do a digital tech unit in year nine. So they come in with prior knowledge. Like for example, what we've done this year, we've just revamped our year 10 program again to step it down one level from this. So with year 10, we've, we're just finishing up an assessment task and we're actually looking at people's communication preferences over time, <laughs> seeing how people have changed from using a dial-up phone to, you know, um, to fax and cell phones and our different cell phone preferences and Twitter and Facebook and looking at generational differences. So that's kind of bringing in the technology curriculum. But I taught the girls then to do a Google Doc survey and they're surveying different age categories and their communication use they're just downloading that information into Excel and learning how to graph it. And then they're putting some of their graphs into a little report in Word. So that supports this, the next level up. And then we're, our next unit, they're going to take one thing that they found really topical based on their survey and they're going to make a little stop motion video about it. So then we're going to do some digital media. And so we do kind of that same process and in, mini in miniature in year 10 and we start like even in year 10 I've started them having the key features document so we did word okay let's screenshot what are some key features of word what are some key features of Excel so I start doing that we're starting to build them up so they that's their expectation 